We're in Daniel 9 today. I'll give you a minute to turn to that. Sometimes called Daniel's prayer for the people. Sometimes called the 70 weeks. So we'll look at those today. No. Okay. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the chance that you continue to give us. The opportunity to share together in your word. To read through it. To see what it really says. To grasp at the things that you want us to know. Which are sometimes difficult. And even today, some are a little bit hidden. I pray today that as we look at this, we'll see everything this chapter has to say. And look at what it says. Don't get ourselves bogged down by bringing in thoughts that we've been taught or read about, some interesting things that might happen. But let us look at exactly what Scripture says, Father. I pray now that you'll bless it. Use my words. Let them be the words you want. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm not going to read through it at first today. That will make our lesson way too long. I'm going to read it as we go. I think it'll work fine. Um, as we've already learned, and I'm just going to do a little bit of quick review, Daniel, of course, bridges the entire 70 years of Babylonian captivity, 580, or 605 to 536 B.C. Nine of the chapters in this book speak to visions and prophecy or dreams. Daniel was God's mouthpiece to the Jewish as well as the Gentile world declaring God's current and future plans. Remember, at his point, it was all future. What Revelation is to the New Testament, apocalyptically as well as prophetically, Daniel is to the Old Testament. I don't think these things are new, just kind of keeping us all in the same vantage if, as we go. Uh, remember Daniel, whose name means God is my judge, was kidnapped from the noble family when he was a boy, probably at the age of 15, give or take deported to Babylon to be reprogrammed into Babylonian culture for the task of assisting and dealing with the imported Jews. They didn't even know what was going to happen at that time, but God had a plan. That he spent the remainder of his life there, probably lived to 85 plus. We'll see more of that later. As time passed, Daniel was used greatly by God to present God and his plan to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Okay, now prominent, there's a theme in this book that stands out above all the rest, and that's God's sovereign control over the affairs of rulers and nations, and that doesn't change. And their final replacement with the true king, Jesus Christ the Messiah. He would come someday, and we're going to see some stuff about that today. Um, not only is he coming but he will come and rule and show glory over men. He's like the stone in chapter 2, you'll recall. In chapter 7, he was the son of man. Last week in chapter 8, he was the prince of princes and the prince of the host. Today in verse 26, we'll see that he is the anointed one or Messiah. And we track those through Daniel. We can see a lot of statements about Christ's kingdom. Okay? There's a second theme woven through all this, although we don't see it specifically in today's lesson, and that is that God's power is displayed through miracles that he performs. And we've seen a lot of those in Daniel as we've gone along. So if you're like most people, and I don't know where we all stack up in this, but it, when you hear Daniel 9 and you start to study it, at least a lot of the people I've talked to, they get real caught up at the end of the chapter what's called the 70 weeks of Daniel sometimes. Prophecy, significant prophecy. And there are books and books you can read. But we're going to look at all of Daniel 9 today. We're going to see that there's four areas that are, are spoken of. Um, we're going to look at Daniel's purpose in verses 1 and 2. Then his prayer, which is verses 3 through 19, which is a little over two-thirds of the chapter. So I would think that'd be where we'd spend most of our time. God's peace through Gabriel. Gabriel comes back in verses 20 to 23. And then finally, in 24 to 27, we have the prophecy of 70 weeks. And we will look at what the Bible specifically says about this. What it says. 
not what we think, okay? I, you're welcome to bring anything up anytime as I'm going along, but I'm going to try real hard to stick with what the Bible specifically says. And you're welcome to correct me if I don't. Um, now, Jeremiah, I want to, where do I want to go here? Um, yeah. So Daniel studied and learned from the books, it says, or the scrolls of the prophets. Specifically, Jeremiah, he studied a lot. And he discovered that the desolation of Jerusalem would continue for 70 years. And these 70 years were drawing to a close at this point in his life. So, the context also indicates that Daniel believed these 70 years to be literal years. And based on that, it would appear the Jews were about to come out of exile and go back. So let's look at Daniel 9, 1 and 2 to start us off. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent of Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the des end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. That's a long time, but it's coming to an end, it says. And Daniel figured this out by digging into Scripture. Specifically, he looked at Jeremiah 25, 11, and 12, which says, The whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And after 70 years are completed, I'll punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. He goes on, and in Jeremiah 29.10 we see, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill, fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. And since 70 years were coming to a conclusion, Daniel knows this because he's been there all this time. He's been keeping track of it. He says um, he prayed for God's next move on behalf of Israel. And if we look at 2 Chronicles 36, 21, it says to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Now we're seeing some more purpose here, okay? Um, so it, Scripture clearly indicates there would be 70 years of exile in Babylon. I think that's pretty clear. Now, and it indicates that why, the reason why was to restore the Sabbath that had been ignored. Let's look at that. Leviticus 25, 4 through 5 tells us, But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall sow your field, you shall not sow your field, or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest. Or gather the grapes of your undressed vine, it shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. Which was declaration of God that they had violated and finally, in Leviticus 26, 34 through 43, an excerpt of that, we see that the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as it lies desolate while you're in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. So they would be in Babylon while the land rested for 70 years. And those who are left shall rot away in your enemy's lands because of the iniquity, their iniquity, and the iniquities of their fathers. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers and their treachery that they committed against me, if they humble their hearts and make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant. And I will remember the land after it lies desolate for 70 years for the Sabbaths that were ignored. So Daniel understood that God keeps his promises, in this case covenants, okay? And they are to encourage prayers. And the whole point of this is leading up to Daniel's prayer. And the prayers are necessary, not needless, if some people might think. If, in fact, God moves in your heart to pray, as he is in Daniel, as we'll see, it is necessary to pray because that's what God wants. So that was a piece, as we read through this, that we see, and we'll see again, God calls for his people to turn to him. That was there. And Daniel 
not only has learned about the 70 years, he sees the need for this prayer. That's real critical in, in working up to where we're headed. So, that's what he did. With that, we'll move to Daniel uh, 9, 3 through 19. But before we, we do say it, I want to I read what Charles Spurgeon had to say about this prayer before we read it, because it's so good. He says, A true-hearted believer does not live for himself. Where there is abundance of grace and great strength of mind in the service of God, there is sure to be a spirit of unselfishness. As was Daniel's prayer by the blessing of God's Spirit, and it should inspire us with the spirit of prayer. As Daniel exemplified, it should move us to forget ourselves and remember others. It should help us to be unselfish and lead us to care for our own people, even God's people to whom we have the honor and privilege to belong. And as we read through this, see if you can specifically see Daniel's unselfishness in this prayer. It reads, Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking Him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from Your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame. As to this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Israel, or of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, and all the lands to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his ways, which he set before us by his servants the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us. Yet we have not entreated the favor of, our, of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity that has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Now, that is a pretty powerful prayer. And no matter how you see Daniel, he's a sinner like the rest of us. But in that time, he's considered a pretty righteous man. He seems to be 
taking on all the sins of Israel to himself. There's something to think about as we talk about it. Now his prayer shows a few key things about how to pray. And we're going to talk about that for just a minute as we walk through it. Uh, it flows from the study of God's Word to start with. He learned a lot. He sees a lot. Look again at verse 2 where it says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass. So where did he get his information? He got it from the word of God. He got it from studying. And it was God who showed him what it meant, obviously, through the Spirit. Okay? But that's important. And we need to take that strongly because there's a lot can be learned. The Bible exists. Even then it existed. The scrolls were available. Uh, Daniel was a learned man. There's no doubt about it. <clears throat> and he had access to the scrolls. For whatever reason, the Babylonians had brought those. And as he read those, God revealed things to him. Real key to that is the 70-year return from exile. And that's what's really being focused on at this point. And I'm going to go back to what I say every time I talk about this. God's Word is true. You can probably tell me the verse I'm going to quote. 2 Timothy 3.16, which tells us that all Scripture is inspired or spoken out, breathed out by God, profitable for doctrine or teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. This is critical to us. Daniel is significant. Our study of Daniel is significant, but if it tells us anything, prayer is very, very important, and the study of God's Word is equally important. His prayer was based on what he had learned from God's Word, and how God, through the Holy Spirit, moved in him to pray for the people the way the Scripture was telling them to pray. So that's real important. If we track all that, we catch up with ourselves, so to speak, and understand, well, so this is what he was really doing, okay? He believed in predictive prophecy. Everything that he talks about, which are prophetic, were future. Now, you could argue a little bit that he was around long enough to see the Babylonians get taken over by uh, the next group, or the Medo-Persians get taken over by, I get them backwards, I'm not going to go into it. But he saw the first part, okay? Now, with that in mind, it just helps him. He's seen a lot of pieces, but at the times that he sees them, they're prophecy. We look back, a lot of what we've studied in Daniel has happened, but now today, we definitely are into things that have not yet happened. So, Men write a lot of things about them. That's good. And they're, they're based on their study of the Bible. But they might get something wrong. And we don't have facts to back it all up. That's all I'm going to, okay? Now, he does give us a model for how to pray. His model that he uses here that we're looking at today is adoration, humility, confession, and petition. Most of us know the petition is not just for ourselves, intercession, but it's also for others, supplication. And he, start, he starts out with adoration. He's already done that, but he moves then to show that glory and adoration to God. He humbles himself. And that humility is the big thing in Daniel's prayer here. Um, he shows a humble and contrite attitude as he approached the Lord in prayer. In fact, by turning and from reading the scriptures, we see he goes, he prays, for he pleas of mercy, but he does it in a threefold posture of fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Now, we don't take up that practice today. But today, that practice tells us to set apart time for prayer in our own lives. We need to pray. We need to establish the fact that we pray. Now, I agree with pray always, and I think I do that a bit. I keep an attitude of prayer. I bring things up with the Lord all day long. But he's talking about a very specific set time where you actually commit to pray, commit to pray for specific things. And this is what Daniel's trying to do, and this is what he's showing. And we know as we've studied his life, as we've gone through, he had three times a day that he prayed. He always did it. No matter what the outcome was going to be, he always did it. Okay? Now, 
I would also add for us that if we have a humble and contrite attitude towards prayer, we'll be able to do that. And your attention will stay on the prayer. If you're like me, sometimes your mind might drift. I'm sure it's just me, but I'll think of other things too while I'm praying. And I need more and more and more to be fully committed to the things that I'm doing at the time I'm doing it. I find when I study the Bible, if I'm fully committed to that, I get a lot more out of it. I think most of us can say that. So that's kind of what we want to see as we get going here. Well, Daniel had a very heavy heart. He could hardly bear. We've seen already through the various visions that he had how difficult things were. And now he's figured out what he's praying for. He's been called to pray for Israel to come out of exile. And there's a lot that we read that talks about that. And his prayer is incredibly intense. And he needs to find the strength to pray this. And and a comparison, if we want to make a comparison of Daniel's Old Testament prayer, how difficult was it? Not perfectly and not totally, but it's almost comparable, comparable, I guess, to Jesus' prayer about 600 years later in the Garden of Gethsemane. Meaning, how hard was the subject? How immersed was he in the prayer? How did Daniel feel about it? How tough was it? He was called and he knew it was a difficult thing to do. And that's what he did. So he is confessing the sins of Israel. And he isn't just confessing them, he's taking them upon himself. He's making himself the representative of all those and all they have done. And that's pretty solid. And that's him pouring out. So he, his prayer teaches us now in the verses 5 to 14 how to be honest and make a full confession for sin. And that's what we're going to look at real quick. But I'm going to start it. There's a verse that a lot of us call the assurance of um, forgiveness. It's highlighted in 1 John 1, 9. I think a lot of you know it. So if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this is, seems to be taken at many different levels. But this is a bearing of your heart before God. A humble and contrite heart that truly understands that God knows everything. It is a repentant heart. I'm reminding us too that repentance is a gift from God, Romans 2.4. And we need to remember that. So we've got to pray even for the repentance to be able to be confessing. These are things that Daniel understands. A full confession before God who already knows everything. Well, as he moves to verse 4, he makes it clear that he's confessing before God. But he starts that with the adoration. He says, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. And then in verse 5 to 14, he uses a lot of terms to identify the sin of Israel. And he uses we throughout this to make it understand it's him too. And these terms include sinned, done wrong, acted wickedly, rebelled, turned away, not listened, disloyalty, public shame, rebelled, not obeyed, broke your law, turned away, and refused to obey. That's a pretty long list of things any one of us would go, oh, that wasn't good. And this is specifically with relationship to commands God had specifically given to Israel. And because of that, they're in exile. That's the whole reason they're there, because of their iniquity against God. So, Daniel puts himself on the side of the Israelites, even though he really hasn't done a lot of that. Most of us realize that in his time, Daniel was considered a fairly righteous man, as righteous as a man can be. That's not God's righteousness. It can be imputed to us, but that's not God's righteousness because you're acting good, necessarily. But a lot of people see it different. But concerning Daniel's solidarity with the Hebrews in their sins, I want to read what Brian Chappelle said about this prayer. 
Daniel confesses the reality of his sin and the people's sin because he has been called to carry their burden as his own. Even though he didn't cause the burden, he feels responsible for the people under his control. Now we've noted earlier that Daniel is a type of Christ. And it's like this that he demonstrates that he's a Christ type, if you will, in the Old Testament. A picture of the coming Messiah. Well, his confession echoes what it says in Isaiah 6, an acknowledgement of the brokenness of the marriage covenant with Yahweh, which is also spoken of in Ezekiel 16.8. It admits to not keeping the Lord's commands and ordinances, acknowledges that they haven't listened to God's prophets. And as a result, Daniel acknowledges that the nation's exile is right and just. Pretty big. Because the Lord... Our God is righteous in what he's done. Their public shame is deserved because they have disrespected the great and awe-inspiring God. That's pretty significant. And if you'll think back, Moses discussed curses in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Remember the blessings and the curses? There are about this many blessings and this many curses. And now they have all fallen upon them because they have totally ignored and disobeyed God. And there's a portion of his prayer that closes with verse 14. It says, Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity that has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works that he has done, and we have not obeyed. Well, as another commentator put it, Daniel seems to be saying that though Israel has gone through the ravages of God's curse, the people remained unchanged, unbroken, and unrepentant. That's pretty strong stuff. These are God's people, and look what they've done. Um, there There is no genuine repentance in them, and that's the whole point that is being made. Daniel is clearly repentant, He is a repentant man who has taken up that prayer that was discussed uh, back in Chronicles and he is praying for the people. He is praying for God's will to be done, which is very significant. Um, It's not characteristic to Israel. I'm talking now about true repentant confession. It was not characteristic to Israel. And truthfully, it's not characteristic to humanity today. It just isn't. Uh, How many times have you seen cases of strong remorse but realize it's not repentance? They got caught. They're sad. They're hurt. But they're not turning to their God. And God is the God of all humanity. And that's just the way it is. But we have to be careful because we don't always confess fully to God, which would make us guilty as charged too. Just some things to take forth. Now his fourth prayer characteristic is highlighted in verses 15 through 19. And as I said before, that is intercession and supplication as he steps forward to help others. And I want to start with a couple of verses. John 16, 24, often referred to as an assurance of answered prayer. Uh, tells us that until now you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be made full. Before we go too far with that verse, I want to say specifically, this verse does not support the prosperity gospel. And the prosperity gospel doesn't do anything to support God, no matter what you may have heard anywhere. The whole point of this is that Daniel's trying to bring his people back to the Lord through prayer. And in a specific case, he's asking in the name of the Lord, which means he's asking in accordance with God's will. That's what this is about. It's about doing it in God's will. Because if you're praying and it's not God's will, I wouldn't hold my breath too much. I really wouldn't. But if it's in God's will, it may happen. God has a timing thing too. And that's important to remember when we get into into prayer. Um, Daniel sees God's righteousness as the basis for the judgment in verse 6, as well as the basis for his prayer of forgiveness in verse 16. 
Sinclair Ferguson said that in Scripture, righteousness basically means integrity. And in all seriousness, sometimes it's defined as conformity to a norm. And people want to hold God to some norm. And God will be held to a norm. And that norm is His character. He will always do what He says He will do. We're the ones with the problem. That's the whole point of this. So, this prayer, which is God-centered and people-oriented, appeals to the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps covenant to act for the sake of His own name. That's something we got to remember. He moves according to His character, righteousness, and compassion. Mercy and grace flow out of Him as He chooses for them to flow. So Daniel goes on in verse 16 to appeal to God's righteous acts. He's trying not only to confess sins, but appeal and plead with the Lord to turn His wrath and anger away from the city of Jerusalem. Why? Because as the results of sins, your people, Jerusalem and your people, have become a byword, an object of ridicule. And he recognizes that the 70 years are coming to an end. What is he, what's God going to do? He's the one making the prayer to try to get God to continue. And in one sense, he knows he will. He also knows this prayer is required. And I would say in the Spirit is moving him to pray these specifically, even to the point of us being here to hear these words and to begin to understand them. Um, a byword, an object of ridicule. Daniel appeals to God's city, his holy hill, his people, his servant, his desolate sanctuary, his own sake, his city, and his name. Look again at verses 17 through 19 as we finish up this prayer. Now therefore, our God, O oh, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy and for your own sake, O oh Lord. Make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that's called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Daniel appeals strongly. He cries out for forgiveness in verse 19. And I think we can all, if not before, at least by now, see this burden that Daniel's carrying, how strong it really is. It is significant. He cries out, he calls God not to delay and not to act for the sake of Israel, but to act and forgive for his own sake. Do it to bring glory to your name and to show the nations just who you are and what you're like. Another line I read says that speaking to God, he says, you ruined your reputation for the sake of the Israelites. Now do this for your reputation. Well, before we go further, here are a few words about prayer to consider. As I've read all these different guys now and thought about it, and, and I think it's significant for all of us to just remember that prayer is the mark of a Christian. How often do we actually communicate with God through Christ, our mediator? And I think this group probably does it quite a bit. Um, but this can all be summed up in one key statement. You'll like the short statement. It's just do it. You've heard that before, I know. But when you think the word prayer, just do it. We must make time for prayer and then pray. It's easy to make the time and then don't do it. Um, and remember, you may not receive an immediate answer. The answers will come. They'll come in God's timing. We see answers here in a second with respect to Daniel coming pretty quick. And that's important to see too. But know too that if you're praying in God's will, your faithfulness will be rewarded. It's just a matter of how and when. Well, let's move to verses 20 to 23. Gabriel steps in now to help Daniel. He says, While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, 
and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, who I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I've come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Now, I've mentioned this to a few people. I have something to say before we go any further, and I'm going to quote from Alistair Begg. Alistair has written much on this portion of Scripture, and this is specifically titled Gabriel in the 70 Weeks. And as Alistair puts it, in what follows, I reserve the right to change my mind later, and as often as necessary for the rest of my life, <laughs> until I finally settle the matter. What I'm about to now unfold for you will annoy some, disappoint others, confuse many, and perhaps encourage a few. And I think that's reasonable. Depending on where you stand and how strong you stand on it, it may affect you different than the person sitting next to you. But if you're careful and you listen specifically to the words and stay with just the words, I shouldn't really offend anybody. That's all I'm trying to make sure I do, okay? I do pray that it's reasonably clear and it is not easy. This is easily the hardest part of the book of Daniel, these four verses. There are the hard parts, so don't get the wrong message. But these are the hardest, and these are probably the ones the most has been written about, according to the most of the people I've read. And in keeping with trying to be understanding and using good, solid people to help me here, I'm going back to Spurgeon. He says, The Lord appointed a set time for the coming of His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. Nothing was left to chance. This is what we're going to learn about. The advent of the Christ and His work are the highest point of the purpose of God. The hinge of history, the center of providence, and the crowning of grace. This is what Daniel's talking about. The Christ appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself, the event before which all other events must bow. Prophecies declared the date long before infallible wisdom had settled it. Note that the Lord told His people somewhat darkly, but still with a fair measure of clearness that the Christ would come. And what we're supposed to get out of this is the idea that for those with enough study and knowledge, even back in Daniel's time, potentially they should have been able to bracket when the real Messiah was coming. That's the whole point. Looking backwards, it's not too hard to see the things that have happened. That's not the point of contention in what I'm getting ready to talk about. I don't think it is anyway. So what do we got? Um, Daniel prayed, and the angel Gabriel came again. Remember, we saw him back in chapter 8, verses 15 to 17. He is a gift. He was sent specifically to help Daniel to understand the vision. And he made a statement to Daniel that's pretty solid. I'm sure you didn't miss it. Daniel was greatly loved. Now, that statement should have helped him with his extreme weariness. And I'm not saying it didn't. I'm just saying that that's what it was there for. Have you ever thought of the potential that you might fit that bill? Maybe great isn't the right word to use. But if you're a believer, you are loved by God. That should carry us through our day. It really should. Of recent, I've heard lots of talk about depression and other people having problems. And I'm not saying those things aren't real. So don't mistake what I'm going to say. But if anything's going to get us through those things, it's knowing that God truly loves us and that we have a real eternity with Him. And that's what's being talked about here. There's a lot of difficulty getting there for people. We may be persecuted. Many things may happen. But it doesn't change our eternity. That's what we've got to remember. Daniel's in the middle of that. Now, Gabriel came, it says, at about the time of the evening sacrifice. Kind of interesting. The evening sacrifice has not happened since 586 B.C. when the temple was destroyed and they were all hauled away. But Daniel's still on Jerusalem time. He keeps track of everything. Um, that's part of the reason he knows that they've been in exile for almost 70 years. 
I don't know if many of the other Israelites are tracking these things, but Daniel's being kept abreast of what's happening. And God sent Gabriel, Gabriel to help him and, and help him recognize that the exile, the future of that exile, was really coming. A couple more things to bring up. Matthew 6, 8. The Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This was the same for Daniel. As soon as he started praying, Gabriel was dispatched. He knew what Daniel needed. One of Gabriel's statements, you are greatly loved. And he needed that. Things were tense for him. I mean, he's really buried in what he studied. He really sees what's happening to Israel and what the needs are. So at the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I've come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. And with that, we get to the vision. Verses 24 through 27, I'm pretty much on time. I intend to leave about this much time for it, so there would be some. But again, as I said in the beginning, don't get caught up in the pieces. Even, you know, we, they didn't come with chapters. But we have these divisions because some people who are really smart helped us with how to break it down and kind of track along. Although some chapters tend to straddle a lot. But in this chapter, it is a pretty solid chunk. And this four verses should not outweigh the other 23 verses so significantly as they seem to do, especially if you get yourself caught up in some of these prophecy conferences. And I've been to a couple. They're fun. But don't get caught up. <laughs> anyway. They, it says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. Now that should be really clear based on what we've said already. Okay. No, that's a joke. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the sixty-two weeks an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who has come to destroy the city and the sanctuary, its end shall come with a flood and to, to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for half a week. He shall put an end to the sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes, desolation, makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Okay, I read this through a lot of times and I still can't quite get it out just right. <laughs> There's a lot in there, and it's very difficult. I'm not going to talk about half of it, I'm sure. So it's not it with intent. It's just not practical. But Daniel has asked God to bring an end to the 70 years in exile, just like he's, in a sense, been told to pray. God said it was going to happen. If my people pray, as he tells them to pray, and Daniel has done that, then Gabriel says it's going to take another 77s before complete deliverance will come. So although Israel's going to go back after 70 years, it will not be a return from complete exile, if you will. They will no longer be gone. They'll be back in Jerusalem. But it's not going to be fully complete. It's kind of what he's saying. So again, as I said, I've already said a few times, my focus is on what the Bible says. It does say 70 weeks. 7, 62, and 1. So there's something to that, and it's our job to figure some of that out. And those 70 weeks refers to 70 sets of 7 years or weeks, or weeks, yeah, or weeks of years. Now there's a Hebrew word, Shabuah, and I may not have pronounced that right. Anybody can help if they want to. Um, in Genesis 29, 15 through 28, and that word means seven days or seven years. Seven days and seven years in the same context. So we're stuck. It could be one or the other and it could be used. We have to figure it out from the context. Now, the term for weeks simply refers to a unit of seven. 
The Hebrew word here is often used to mean a unit of seven days, but it is also used for a unit of seven years. So we haven't solved our problem yet. And the Jews had sabbatic years. You know that. Okay. By which the years were divided into weeks of years is the term. As in this important prophecy, each week containing seven years. When they mean the sabbatic, the seventh year, the seven years of that week, the seventh year is the sabbatical year. So simply stated, the prophecy as delivered to Daniel deals with the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. There are two princes. The Messiah is identified in chapter, or I'm sorry, verse 25. And another prince who's identified as the Antichrist, but not specifically here, but you know it, in verse 26. So we got those down. And the time period covered by the prophecy, again, is 70 weeks divided into those three parts. The time period begins or began from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem. It's right there in verse 25. We're sticking just with what the word says, okay? And it'll end when Messiah the Prince comes to establish his eternal kingdom. And that'll be 70 weeks. The end result is highlighted in verse 24. To finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint the most holy place. And I did use a variety of commentaries. Elders know we went to this conference and I bought a whole bunch of different kinds of books on Daniel. I didn't want to focus on the covenant, the dispensationalists, the other guy, you know, call him what you want. So I've got a bunch of them that I've looked at and I'm sticking with the things that we can all agree on. Anyway, we are confronted with one of the most remarkable prophecies about Christ. And what is the key to this? It's about his coming and his salvation. That's the magic, if you will. It shows that the Jews have, are guilty of the most obstinate unbelief of expecting another Messiah so long after the time expressly fixed for his coming. And they should be able to look back and see that. But they don't. The 70 weeks may likely represent a day for a year. I think most agree with that. Or 490 years. And at the end of that period of time, a sacrifice would be offered, making full atonement for sin, bringing in everlasting righteousness for the complete justification for every believer. Now, that ought to sound like the Messiah coming. Okay? Um, then the Jews, along with the Gentiles, in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, their Messiah, would commit the crime by which the measure of their guilt would be filled up and by which they would bring great troubles upon their nation. Now, these are just the way it's fall, fallen out. It's not hard for these guys to write this. All of the blessings bestowed on sinful man have come through Christ's atoning sacrifice. That makes sense, okay? 1 Peter 3.18, he suffered once, the just for the unjust, that we might be, um, he, that he might bring us to God. He is our way of access to heaven. None of these things, I think, are questionable at all. This seals the sum of prophecy and confirms the covenant with many. And while we rejoice in the blessings of salvation, we should remember that they caught what they cost the Redeemer. How can those escape? who neglect a great salvation. Now, taking a little further, let's walk through what that said. To finish the transgression speaks to the transgression of God's chosen people against himself and that it will end. Okay? To make an end of sins means not only the end of the guilt or punishment of sin, but an end to the sin itself or the presence of sin. It means to seal up or to restrain sins. This looks at a new redeemed world. That's something coming. To make reconciliation for iniquity tells us that man's iniquity must be reconciled to God's justice and holiness. This work was clearly accomplished at the cross of Christ. To bring an everlasting righteousness, one might take this as an, in an individual sense. I kind of mentioned it earlier, thinking that someone was righteous in and of himself. People see that in people, but that's not God's righteousness. The Messiah is going to bring in a whole new order, if you will, of righteousness, God's righteousness, and he's done that, imputed to believers. To seal up vision and prophecy, well, this speaks to the ending and fulfillment of prophecy, 
all near and far term prophecy will be completed at some time. I'll say it, I was going to save this till the end. Um, there are about 1,500 prophecies in the Bible about the Christ. Anyone can read it and find those. Read, you know, they've got books on it. And about a thousand of them have been completed at this time, fulfilled. They will, all be fulfilled. they will all be fulfilled when the time of to seal up vision and prophecy comes. Okay? To anoint the most holy. Well, taken at its simple, literal meaning, this refers to a place, not a person. There is a most holy place. The most holy place of the temple will be anointed. So taken as a whole, Gabriel made a remarkable announcement to, da to Daniel. He told him each of these amazing things would happen within the period of 70 weeks. Okay? Now looking back at history, we can only say these things already fulfilled if we ignore their plain, literal meaning and give them a spiritualized meaning that replaces the plain meaning. I want to be careful on how I say that. You can be very careful that we keep things plain and black and white. We can argue literal and spiritualized. Some things go either way. But some believe these promises were fulfilled generally in the spread of the gospel over the centuries. And that belief would neglect the plain and simple meaning of the words. Because there's a lot of the things that haven't happened. And if you take that as the gospel going to every nation, we believe the gospel has been preached at least once in every nation. Whether or not that's part of it, I'm not going to try to argue. Gabriel revealed to Daniel that the starting, he gave him the starting point of the 70 week prophecy. Okay? There was a command to restore and build Jerusalem in history that started this specific period of time. And I'm using this to help us understand the difficulty again because different people cling to different things. In Ezra 1, Cyrus made a decree in 538 BC which gave Ezra and the Babylonian captives the right to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. In Ezra 6, Darius made a decree in 517 BC which gave Ezra the right to rebuild the temple. In Ezra 7, Artaxerxes made a decree, 458 BC, giving Ezra permission, safe passage, and supplies to go build the temple. Then in Nehemiah 2, 1 through 8, Artaxerxes made another decree in 445 BC, giving Nehemiah the permission, the stuff, to go and rebuild Jerusalem, the streets and the walls. Now, it's the rebuilding of Jerusalem that it says in verse 25 that starts the 70 weeks. So that's what it was, not the other things, okay? We just want to make sure we get it straight. Then it says, until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So Gabriel's message to Daniel, 69 units of seven years or 483 years. Is that realistic? Well, from the time when Nehemiah was given permission till Jesus entered Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday was 483 years, Jewish years. Make sure we get our stuff right. Yes, ma'am. Um, when they were exiled to Babylon and then they came back, what was, what was happening in Jerusalem at that time? Were there other peoples living there? Well, if we take this quick, we got a minute. Look at history. Some of the poorer less able people were left behind to kind of take care of the place. So it was run down unbelievably. So as the Jews began to come back, they began to focus on the temple. And you remember in Nehemiah, Nehemiah's brother had come back and said, oh, it's horrible. It's in such a state of disrepair. And so Nehemiah appealed to Artaxerxes, who let him go under a promise he'd eventually come back and go and rebuild it. That's the really quick I'm sure Aaron could tell us half an hour's worth of stuff on that. <laughs> but that's the basics. Wouldn't you agree with that? Good. I didn't get wrong. That's important. <laughs> so anyway, we see that. But then we have another piece before we get into speculation. Now that we've seen that fall out, go, whoa, what about the next week? In Daniel 12, 9, we're going to see, he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the end of time or the time of the end, I apologize. It's not ready for that to come out. We are still living in a time when prophecy is unfolding. We see all kinds of stuff. I hear people say, this has got to be it. 
And I'll say things like, well, if I'd lived in 1942 in Europe, I might think that was it. If I'd lived in 1917, I might have thought that was it. If I'd have lived way back in the times of the Crusades, I might have thought that was it, if I had good biblical knowledge. And I'm not going to say, no, it's not. But we're in the time of birth pangs. We're in the time of rumors of wars and all kinds of things like that. That does not mean it's tomorrow. But we live like it's imminent. With that, we have to remember. Okay? Um, Our biggest takeaway is that God's Word is true and the prophecies about the Messiah are real. If you leave today with the fact that God's Word is true and we need to study His Word, you have learned what you needed to learn. Yes, ma'am. Thanks, Bob. I think this is super interesting and I appreciate you taking it in and absorbing the small percentage of it. But I think what my big takeaway today is going to be that those who are in Christ are greatly loved. Amen. It's a nice thing to know, isn't it? Kelly, in case you didn't hear it, said those who are in Christ are greatly loved. And their prayers are greatly desired. That goes hand in hand with that. That was my end almost. And all I'm going to say now is if anybody else have any comments or questions. I've gone longer than I thought I would. You do have? You say you have something? Yeah. He's getting it. Pretty much Daniel's prayer at the end where he said, God, pay attention to me. Yes. I don't get how someone can pray that like God's not paying attention. He's appealing. And the way Daniel is appealing to God is captured best in that statement that I think it was Chappelle. You can help me, uh, Phil. I don't remember who specifically said it. That God had forsaken his reputation for the Israelites. So he's appealing to him upon his reputation. Um, A lot of key prayers in the Bible appeal to God as for his sake, for his reputation, for his desires. And that's really what he's saying. He says a lot of things, but he's appealing to God on God's character for God's purpose to do what God intends. He's not challenging him if if you sense it that way. And I think you could see it that way if you're not careful. He is humbling himself and calling on God to do what God would do. And if it isn't in our favor, but do it for your sake. If that makes sense, I hope. You're saying like, don't just focus on one verse, read the whole gist of it. Yeah, the whole prayer, put it together because it all matters. He builds up to saying that. And he, It isn't an issue of I have a right to talk to God like that. God has moved in the Spirit to have Him say those things, really, for us to read. And many, many, many others. Okay? Terry. I don't disagree. Pray God's attributes. Paul. I don't think it was, uh, well, in, in looking at it, I think when we first started uh, Daniel, and I think Aaron kind of brought this out, uh, mentioned his youth uh, during this time. So I, I just think it's a good lesson for the youth now that uh, Daniel was used by God uh, even in his youth mm-hmm. this time. So even now, with youth that, well, they mean, think, well, I need to, you know, grow up a little bit more, I need to get older. No, God can use that as well in their youth, like Daniel. Yeah, if we assume he was 15, he was already pretty learned at that right. point. He didn't just start there. Phil, did you have something? Well, I was going to go back <clears throat> to the previous question about the hear and see. Obviously, he hears and sees all things. Yeah. That was his way of requesting, now act on it, you know. So he was emphasizing, hear, and then do something see and then do something you know and it's really the request to do it's not a statement that you don't sometimes not see and not hear and it fulfills what it said in chronicles if my people will come to me and pray and confess their iniquity then i'll do it so he's kind of saying what god tells him to say let's pray father in heaven we thank you 
your scripture is so solid and so so rich we can only barely scratch it and we thank you that you allowed that today thank you for what you have shown us there is way more in here and we can't begin to grasp it all but one day we will know help us to remember not to get bogged down in prophecy but to continue your mission of spreading your gospel throughout the world we thank you and praise you in jesus name amen